Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed, secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Hi, my name is Crystal Lee Hemphill, and I'm owner and principal broker of Crystal Lee Realty in Boca Raton, Florida. You can contact me on my website at www.crystalleigh.realty.com or you can contact me on my office line, 561-859-0849. So tell me all about you. Tell me what you do and how you make your money and why everybody should listen to you. Okay, absolutely. I actually started my real estate career, surprisingly enough, at the top of the Great Recession in 2009. I was just out of college. I went to University of Miami, and I was a cheerleader there, and I was focusing on studies and also my extracurricular activities, but I wanted to find another way to get an extra source of income. So that's what got me interested in real estate. And right away, I I got lucky with my immediate success, although we were in a time of a great recession. And I identified the top producer in my office with Douglas Elliman in South Beach. Uh And I basically Uh piggybacked off him the entire time. So he was my mentor. He taught me everything that I knew. And he taught me the ins and outs of real estate investment. He also was dealing with only luxury listings. And he was explaining to me with leasing versus buying, you're doing the same amount of work, but you make twice the amount of money doing buying, seller representation. So he really led me to want to continue on being on the path of a luxury realtor And so now, to this day, I am an established real estate broker with my own firm, and I focus on celebrity listings, high net worth individuals, sports athletes, anyone in South Florida that's looking to buy a multi-million dollar home, I'm happy to represent them on the buyer side, but my main focus has been the seller side. And currently, I have a celebrity listing. I have Joanna Krupa. She is a supermodel Uh from Miami's Housewives, and right now she's doing Poland Top Model, and we just listed her house in the market for sale for $2.5 million in the Four Seasons in Brickle. So I just put that on the market, and I have a beautiful virtual tour that you can view on my website at www.crystalleerealty.com. And so how did you get your new client? Actually, I am very good friends of her younger sister, Marta Krupa, and also her husband, Roman Zago, who is an owner of a very popular nightclub here in South Beach. Marta is around my age. She actually moved to Miami at the same time I did, and she was one of my first friends in the area, and she had introduced me to her sister, and she had a home in L.A. but due to her career, but she frequented Miami quite a bit and we developed a relationship for the past few years and we've kept in touch which I always make sure to keep in touch with all of my clients and she called me just recently saying Crystal I know you're the best in the business I want you to sell my property because I can only trust my property with you oh boy that was good that was nice that's a nice compliment that's really nice yes so let me ask you uh, (laughs) you, you said you're best in the business tell me why you're best in the business and then tell us how you got there Okay, absolutely. I consider myself best in the business because from start to finish, I am giving you that extra touch, that that extra feel that you're getting the absolute 100% attention from me. I'm not going to be handing off my business to any of my other agents, and I'm taking care of you from the beginning to the end and even afterwards and maintaining client relationships. I listen to my clients exactly what they're looking for, exactly what they need, and I try to go the extra mile to give them everything that they're looking for and everything that they need. And I really try to ask for referrals, and anytime I have a successful transaction with one of my clients, the biggest compliment I can receive is receiving a referral. And almost every single time I ask for a referral, I, I do receive one. And basically, I have been at a lot of networking events, and I just really need to get in front of people and start making more friends and making myself uh, a presence with them. So as long as I am constantly around and reminding you, hey, I'm here to help you with any of your real estate needs, <laughs> they're, they're more than likely to uh, reach out to yeah. me whenever they do uh, think of yeah. selling or buying a home. So. 
So isn't the the Miami area, and do you work all the way up to Fort Lauderdale? Fort Lauderdale, or you just work Miami, which was which you do? You I, service, in, in I service I service I service all of South Florida. So I I oh, okay. have no, I got it. Okay. yeah, I have listings yeah. in Miami all the way up to West Palm Beach. So my I main see. focus has been uh, Boca Raton, Fort Lauderdale, and Miami Beach. Now, isn't that a really competitive market? How do you, how do you manage in a competitive market like that? Surprisingly enough, I do see it being a competitive market because there is so many agents in all of the areas that I service. But after the Great Recession, I feel that a lot of agents fell on the wayside. So I would say it's survival of the fittest, I guess is the best way to put it. They, they made the real estate testing more difficult, so the levels of the entry to the barriers of entry into the industry became more difficult. And also a lot of the agents that um, were not out there hustling every single day, they ended up falling on the wayside and then the strongest, most successful real estate agents started. But Do you find it competitive, but do you think you can beat the competitors? That it, is, do you have some, your, your strength is, from what you told me so far, is you're, you're, you're really on top of whatever you're trying to sell. So do you have any other strengths you want to tell us about? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I actually only provide seller and buyer representation. I also provide landlord representation, real estate investments, advisements. I also do home staging as well as interior design and property management. So I'm basically a one-stop shop for all your real estate needs. So uh, I was going to ask you what services, and you just told me a whole bunch of them. So you do, you do a lot of <laughs> basically them. everything, everything you, you can everything. possibly imagine. <laughs> And you're working how many hours a day? Uh, uh, I'm working around the clock. First of all, property management <laughs> has me working at late hours. And, oh. I, yeah, I try to wake up as soon as possible. I'm up at 5 a.m. I get to the gym and start wow. my day. And I like to get all my, my schedule completely organized before 6 a.m. And then yeah, yeah. I have to make sure that I keep in touch with all my best clients. And I, I look at, I make a to-do list every single day, and I star the activities that are going to be making me money. And I make sure to take care of those things first. And I just make sure that I'm in contact with my leads every single day. If I'm not hearing from my tenants, that means everything's going great with all the properties that I am managing. I, I do hear from them at all hours, which is totally fine. And then, as well as interior design, which I have recently just got into, based on, I guess I just have a good eye. Once I sell really? a, client, a client a home, I start giving them some ideas like, oh, you should do this with your kitchen, and it would be really nice if you knocked this wall down. And they're like, wow, have you done this before? And I'm like, I did this with my own personal home. And they're like, do you have any people? you have any people you can refer to me and then one thing leads to another and then they're like can you just do this whole uh, interior design thing for me because I just can't even imagine doing it so oh. that's basically how I started getting into the interior design and then also I'm like okay this is easy I can do home staging as well and it's been a really fun ride and, and I've been extremely busy so to answer your question I feel like there's not enough hours in the day and I'm probably yeah. working at least 10 to 11 hours right now a day. Wow. <laughs> but I'm happy to do what I do. I'm enjoying every minute yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. Sounds to me like you're a problem solver. Would that be fair? Yes. I absolutely like to think of myself as a problem solver. Okay. So what's the biggest challenge you face in a business like this? The biggest challenge I face in the business would be the way that I look. <laughs> I think because... I look so young, even though I'm 30, I'm in a market where most people think that age equals experience. So I am automatically stereotyped, oh, this young girl doesn't know anything about, she could be as, she's as young as my daughter, she's as young as my grandchild. So I automatically sure. get that stereotype when I meet people, right. but people also think a lot younger than I actually am. Most people oh. ask me, they're like, how old are you, 20, 21 years old? And I'm like, no, you can add a few more numbers to that. But I yeah. still consider myself young in the industry, but I'd say that's my biggest challenge that I face. And so how do you get around that? Basically, I get around this challenge 
through explaining to them my, my, my sales history, how I have 20 million in sales volume, how I show them some of my portfolio of my successful transactions. I also have testimonials that I share with my clients at the time of listing presentations or my first time meeting with a buyer. And I explain to them my transaction history of successful clients that I've had and also successful large deals. I, I'm dealing with high-end clients. I'm dealing in, with high net worth people and also properties with a big price tag. And people with properties that cost this much money need to find someone that they can trust and depend on. So by me showing a potential client that I have already worked with people in this league makes them feel more at ease working with me. And I feel that I break through that stereotype of being too young to even know what I'm doing. So you have to, you have to sell yourself first. Oh, 100% I have to sell myself first because when I walk in the door, they think I'm just a little girl that's new to the industry. But after I leave, they, they feel that I, I'm a big girl with, with a oh, lot of geez. experience. <laughs> oh, you know, if I'm answers, they get in trouble. Little girl, big girl, oh, my God, you're in trouble right away. Oh, <laughs> so, you, can say, you can say it, but a man can't say that. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. I hear you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really. So tell me about some of the deals that you made. You said you sold twenty million. Was that like in a year, or is that in a couple of years? Oh, what is that? You said twenty had, million. That's a big number. Yes, it, it has been. I think my average home sale is around a half a million. And I started oh. my career in Miami, and now I have just recently relocated to Boca Raton. I feel that there's much more higher end properties available in Boca, actually. It's a very active market, and there's major turnover here. I've been doing my research. I'm getting to know the market as well as I can by researching where the most home sales are and the average home sale price. And in Boca, I'm working with bigger players, and now I'm trying to make a bigger presence in this area. I already have my network in Miami, which has been great, but now I have recently relocated my office to Boca, and that's why I have started focusing all my energies here. But I have done $20 million in sales volume over the past six years. Six years. And uh -huh. I have a lot of big listings coming to the market as well. That will double that number. So I've gained a lot of traction, especially in the last year. I feel that my listing prices have gone up and up. And now I'm looking at uh -huh. a potential home that I'd like to put on the market for around $10 million. So right oh, there, that sell will really jack up my sales volume. And then sure. I'm looking at another commercial property for around $15 million. So I'm dealing with these big numbers here, and they're getting bigger as I'm more focusing my energies in Boca. Okay, now let me ask you to just say it slowly, how people would contact you. You can contact me on my website at www.crystal, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L, Lee, L-E-I-G-H, Realty, R-E-A-L-T-Y, dot com. Again, that's Crystal Lee Realty, dot com. My office phone number is 561-859-0849. Okay, and it's Crystal with a C like in cash. Crystal with a C like cash. I like that. Okay. All right, all right, good. Okay. All right, so we want to remember, because a lot of people uh, spell it the other way. So it's, it's constant confusing for us people that are trying to keep the crystal. Yeah, straight. I, I yeah, know yeah, that. Yeah. So you learned the business from, uh, you had a mentor. Is it important to have a mentor? I think it is very important to have a mentor in the business because uh -huh. you can get your real estate license by going to school for one week. You take a test in the class, you pass, and then you take the state test, and then boom, you have a license. And most people don't really know what to do with it. And if you're doing schooling within a week, a lot of that information you do not retain. So the only way that you can really learn is through experience. And if you're inexperienced, the only way you can really learn is by teaming up with an experienced person. So I really advise that all newcom newcomers into the real estate industry definitely partner up with a mentor. Because, number mm -hmm. one, you can shadow this person and get real first-hand experience. Second of all, they can teach you from the mistakes they made so you can avoid them at all costs. 
And three, you can just see the way that they run their day-to-day -day business and their schedule and their time management skills. Because I think the biggest problem that realtors have is time management. Because you can waste a lot of time in real estate. So if you partner up with a successful top producer in a brokerage and you see the way that they manage their time, I think that will really help you for your future success. So when you're thinking about real estate and being a real estate broker, is it important to be versed on the real estate or more important to be versed on how to market the real estate? I think that you need to be well versed on how to market real estate most importantly. And I say this because I speak to a lot of agents and I'll ask them the question like, what is your job? What is your focus as a realtor? And I will say about 99% of people will have the wrong answer. So most people will say, oh, it's marketing, it's, it's a website, it's you know, direct mailing, it's meeting people. Yes, it's, uh, those are all a part of real estate and being a successful realtor, but the most important thing is leads, generating leads. And that is how you have to market your real estate business. You, the number one goal to market your real estate business is to get leads. With leads, without leads, you don't have anything. So when people lose sight of that, they they will lose a stronghold of a successful real estate business. And I really feel that if you make sure that every single day you're marketing your business to generate leads, that it will lead you to success. Oh, good. Okay, Crystal, don't give any of your secrets, but. How should people go about generating leads so this is educational for them? Yes, absolutely. So you, realtors and brokers can generate leads in many different ways. I believe that certain techniques work for certain people and then they don't work for others. So the best way to generate leads is to test out certain techniques. So let's say you want to do direct mail marketing. So you want to send out a postcard. You find a certain area that you want to farm. You want to focus on making yourself the number one realtor in this specific area. You create a mailing list or you purchase a mailing list. You create a postcard and you send it to all these homes that are within that certain area. And some realtors will try it once. If they don't get a good response, they're like, oh, I'm going to put that on the back burner. That's not the right thing to do. In order to test it out, you got to give it a full shot. You got to do it for direct mail marketing. I think has a very slow response, so I say a minimum of 12 months, for example. But that direct mail marketing, like I said, has a very slow response. So I like to do also more personal marketing, which would include calling people, calling your uh, sphere of influence. You can think of family members or close friends. You ask them if they need your services, and if not, can you think of anybody that would be able to utilize my services right now? And you'd be really surprised how many people can think of somebody who is either interested in purchasing a home or wanting to sell their home or they're looking to lease a place, whatever it may be. So my, my uh, advice would be to go to the market directly, do direct marketing by calling or making sure that you're setting up time to make yourself um, available for networking events so people know who you are as a realtor and make sure that, like I said before, in your face, hey, anytime you need me, I'm here for you. Anytime you need to buy or sell a home, I'm right here. Don't forget about me. I would definitely recommend a direct mailing. I also think in this era, we need to be seen on digital marketing, so uh -huh. you need to focus on an email campaign, so you're constantly having a touch with your client base. Something, you don't want it to be so overly informative, because sometimes I see these emails that are just way too wordy. You want to keep it short and sweet, just let them know that you're a market leader, give them a few little nuggets of information, and just keep in contact. So. You, you're doing snail mail, digital marketing, and then you're having a personal touch, which is phone call or in person by setting up lunches, doing networking events, hosting events, whatever it may be where you can talk and be in front of people. So with doing all those three, three things at once, I think you're surefire to be a winner. 
Tell me about the mistakes. You've been at this business for a number of years, and uh, tell me about the mistakes that buyers make, and tell me about the mistakes sellers make. Well, the mistakes that buyers and sellers make recently is that they are not, they don't understand the market so well. And I know that there's a lot of websites out there that is just giving unsolicited advice about real estate and market trends. And there's certain websites like Zillow.com that has an automatic home valuation calculator, which I'm not going to knock it completely 100% saying that it's not all accurate. But ask a real estate agent who knows the industry really well and knows the market very well, knows all the comparable sales, all the recent sales in the area, and they are able to put together a better property valuation than any website. It's a website that is typically taking that valuation based on public records, and I, I don't really know what how their program works with these websites like this, but I will say that majority of the time they're inaccurate and typically they're either saying sellers are thinking that their property is worth way more than it is and buyers are thinking that properties are worth way less than they are. There, there's always a problem there but I think that uh, sellers get emotionally attached to their properties and they look at it from an emotional perspective rather than a business perspective so I think that's the big, biggest mistake that sellers make is being too emotionally connected to their property rather than thinking of it in a business perspective. And as far as buyers making mistakes, I would definitely say that a lot of the times they can be penny wise and dollar foolish. They may concentrate on the wrong things. You're trying to get into negotiations and they're focusing on small things and they may kill the deal over it. But you look at it and you're like, okay, so there's a few wrong things during the home inspection. What is it going to cost you? Maybe $2,000. But this property, we got it right at the right price. This is um, exactly what you're looking for. Don't be so stubborn in thinking that, oh, since the seller is just non-negotiable with these home repairs for $2,000, I'm not going to buy the property. A little bit of, like I said, you're focusing on the small things and not looking at the big picture, not realizing like this is exactly what you're looking for. So don't focus on this $2,000 credit. Just focus on getting your dream home at the right price. With a home comes maintenance. You gotta maintain the property. It's pretty standard that you have to put in a little bit of money to get it in the livable condition, the condition that you want it in. Well, earlier you said you were a problem solver, so let me put you in the hot seat. Uh, so we got a client that um, uh, wants to buy the house, but they but uh, they don't want to pay for the repairs. And then we got a client that has a house they want to sell for, <laughs> and they don't want to pay, the, pay, pay for the repairs. How, how do you fix that? When it comes to a situation where a seller doesn't want to pay, fix the repairs and the buyer wants the seller to fix the repairs, there's always an issue. I feel like I run into this almost every single transaction <laughs> because there's really? always wow. Yes. I, I feel that, especially with uh, home investors as well, but the problem here is that people say, okay, I'm selling the house as is, and so when I'm putting it on the market and, I, and I'm selling my property, I expect you to buy it in the condition it is in. And then buyers say, I want my home to be, the, my next home, my future home, to be in perfect condition. What do I have to do at this point? If I am the seller's agent, let's say that the buyer will ask for $5,000 for repairs. And the home inspector had estimated that it would cost $5,000. That's where they get this number from. And he, they, we present this to the seller. And we say, seller, we want $5,000 for the repairs. Because this and this is a problem. It's not even in livable condition, whatever it may be. If the seller says, absolutely not, I am not giving you a single dollar, the house is going to be sold as is. You can take it or leave it. At that point, I try to negotiate for them to come and meet in the middle. I'm like, okay, so what if my the buyer comes up, sorry, the seller will reduce it to $2,500 and will give you a $2,500 credit. So that may or may not work. If it does work, great then at least both sides feel like they're getting something. They're like, okay, at least they're giving me half the amount because 
it's probably not even going to cost me that much, the buyer will say. And the seller is like, I know the house is in perfect condition, but I'm not going to give them 5000 but I'm comfortable with 2500 But let me put myself back in the hot seat. What if that doesn't work? And in a situation like that, I like to get creative and think out of the box. There's always two agents involved in a transaction. You have the seller's agent and the buyer's agent. Regardless of what side you're on, both brokers still have to work together as a team to close this deal. So I like to work with the other broker and I say, okay, so we have a buyer and seller here that are very stubborn and one wants something and the other one wants something else. What can we do about it? So I try to say, okay, what, how about I reduce my commission by X amount and you reduce your commission by X amount, a, a fair amount. And although it may not be much, it may not be nearly close to $5,000, let us say it's $1,000. I'm taking $500 off my commission. She, she or he takes $500 off his. That's $1,000. And we say, okay, buyer, the seller isn't willing to give you any credit, but we, both as agents, we want to make sure that you get this home because it seems perfect for you guys and we'll give you a thousand dollar credit. Typically from that extra effort from somebody that they didn't ask for, it goes a long way. And the buyer's like, wow, my age, they, these agents are on my side, they really want to see this deal happen, I'm definitely going to move forward. And then also, the seller, so on both sides, you, uh, you put a very, very good look for yourself as an agent. The seller's like, wow, I can't believe my agent reduced their commission to make this deal done. They're going above and beyond to make sure this deal gets closed and my home gets sold. I'm going to make sure that I refer them to any of my friends that are looking to sell their home. And I'll think of them in the future because I know they'll go that extra mile to, to get the deal done. And it, it has always worked in the past. And for me, when you're looking at a home, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be making $10,000 commission. What's $500 to me? It's nothing. you got to look at the bigger picture. So now I'm making $9,500, and I have two, a happy buyer and a happy seller. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, absolutely. So everybody's got to get flexible. That's, that's the key. So that's the key to the problem solving. Tell me about some of yeah. the other problems. As far as repairs are concerned? No, just the problems in the business itself. It's, I always thought that the biggest difficulty, and I'm not close to it like you are, would be financing and things like that. How do you work all those things out? I would definitely have to agree that one of a very big problem is obtaining financing right now. Yeah. It's been a lot more difficult for buyers to get financing as compared to in the previous years before the recession. But I also like to assist, at, if when I'm a buyer's agent, I like to assist them through the whole entire loan process. Oh. I have my closest network of mortgage brokers that I work with directly in Boca Raton and also Miami that I have had a lot of success with that I know that, first of all, are very informative because a lot of first-time home buyers are even experienced. Still, we have a new HUD statement. There's a lot of changes every single year in the industry. You've got to have a mortgage broker that you can trust and depend on, and also who gives you, they don't fluff, they don't fluff their buyers. They don't say, oh, yeah, it's going to close, it's going to close, when they know that it's highly unlikely that it's going to close. I will present a deal to my mortgage broker. I'll get on a conference call with a buyer. We talk about their finances openly with a mortgage broker. We tell them about the property the current financial situation of the property, and my mortgage brokers that I trust will tell me, I just don't think this will fly with underwriting, whatever it may be. A lot of issues that people have been having in Miami Beach is, first of all, a down payment. Now, in condominiums, you're looking at putting a minimum of 25% down, which it was a lot less previously, and some are up to 50% down based on vacancies. So you have to be very knowledgeable of the communities and of the buildings to know what sure. the situation is, if you can even obtain financing. Because a lot of these... So stop for a minute, stop for a minute, stop for a minute, because you're talking about the audience quite a bit now. So let's come back down to earth because you're flying high. <laughs> i got to get okay. you down here. Where we get, <laughs> okay. the, the, the listener's not going to understand why someone would have to, I think there's people out there advertising 3% down and you're saying... Sometimes it's 25 and 50. Can you just elaborate on that and explain it to the newcomer to the call? Yes, absolutely. There, there poses always uh, a challenge in financing with all real estate deals. 
With a lot of single family homes, you can put as little as 3% down to 5% down with an FHA loan. But a lot of condominium buildings, for example, in Miami Beach, are not FHA approved. So since they're not FHA approved, you have to do a conventional loan. And based on vacancies, and let's say some people aren't paying their condo dues or whatever it may be, each building has a different situation. And the banks feel that those buildings are more risky to loan money against. So the riskier buildings, which oh, the riskier buildings are the ones that have more vacancies, have more delinquent. You're going to have to put more percent down. So the riskier buildings are, you have to put a minimum of 25 percent down, sometimes even more. So it's always good for a real estate agent to know the buildings and areas very well. And before you move forward with an offer and a contract on a property in a condominium, for example, definitely obtain all the financial information on the building. So you can know if it's a financially healthy building and if the bank who's lending the money to you thinks that this is a financially healthy building. If they are a financially healthy building, you would have to put less down. But you don't run into these issues with single family homes or with townhomes. This is only coming down to condominiums because with financing, you not are only getting personally financed as a person, the bank looks at you and see if you are a healthy person and not a risky person to lend to, then the second step is to see if the building is risky. So with a condominium, it's a two-step, I guess, evaluation process that the bank has to go through, whereas a single-family home and a townhome, you're only evaluating the buyer. Okay, good. Let me ask you a, a question, uh, and then we'll get off condominiums. Uh, when you talk about the buildings part, partially filled and so on, are you talking about old buildings that are on the low end, or is that a result of buildings on the high end, or is it just uh, condominiums in general in a market like, I, I assume you're talking about Miami and South Beach, something like that? Yes. Ever since the mortgage crash and yeah. also the overdevelopment in Miami of condominiums in Brickell and downtown, there became a lot of vacancies right after the Great Recession. And a lot of people became delinquent on their mortgages, and a lot of people became delinquent on their HOA dues, their condo fees. And for that very reason, it was pretty status quo that all the banks made it a minimum requirement for all condominiums, because a lot of them were vacant at, right after the recession, to be 25% down. And ever since then, it's really stuck. I, also, there's a lot of fraud in, I guess, Miami in general. So they're trying to make sure that the bank is trying to make sure that their money is protected and that they're going to get their money back. So this is the best way that they can ensure that the buyer is going to be paying back the loan. So that's what you, that's why you will always see a minimum of 25%. And this goes for high-end buildings and low-end buildings alike. Wow. So mm-hmm. a lot of the high-end buildings, you're looking at a lot of cash out of pocket if you're doing a financing deal. So you, can, I, I typically see a lot of all cash buyers for that very reason. I see. Now, can, the, can a normal buyer through a broker or do it by himself find the financial condition of a building? Yes, absolutely. A buyer can find out all the finance, financial information of each building by requesting it through the condo association. Typically, a realtor would do this on their behalf, and the realtor would advise the buyer if they think this is a a riskier building in the bank size and if you should move forward with putting down a contract on a unit in the building. But this information is easily obtainable by the condo association. Sometimes there may be a small fee of $50 to $100 to request this information. I see. I see. Yeah. I see. All right. Well, these are problems that the average person would never think about, so this is really good information. Tell me about some of the other challenges that buyers have and sellers have. They're not always, they're always not, uh, uh, as I say, simpatico. They, 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 they don't meet eye to eye. I think you said earlier that the uh, sellers uh, um, think they're selling too cheap and the buyers think they're buying for too much. So uh, obviously that's one. What are, what are the problems that people have buying and selling? Other problems that buyers face, I would say, is in Boca Raton, properties go really fast. So you can't drag your feet. So if you see a property that you like and it meets and it's in the location that you want, it's in great condition, it's it's the price that you feel comfortable with, 
go for it. Go for it with your best foot forward. Don't try to lowball it because if you know it's priced right and it's in a good area, then you know that you want to pay at least market value for it. And it will go quickly with someone else who would be willing to pay the market value. So I would say buyers always face a challenge with, oh, I don't know, I'm a little nervous. Some people get cold feet because it's all moving too quick for them. But I always tell my clients, if this, is this, if this property has everything you need, it's in the location that you want, and you're comfortable with the price, even at the ask price, although we're going to get it for lower, we're going to try to, then let's put together a contract today. Let's do it now because this property is going to go fast. And people get so shocked. I tell them, and I always tell them, I'm like, this is a very hot market in Boca right now. There's not enough inventory. There's way more buyers looking for properties and sellers are putting on the market. A lot of the times they drag their feet a little bit and then what happens, the property is sold. And if you're putting together a backup contract, the chances are highly unlikely that that contract can go through. So you lost, a, lost out on the property. So it usually two or three times for a client that's typically, a, some people are just a little slower on decision making or just jumping the gun, especially for a, a, a large ticket item. I, I understand, but it's really hard to find the perfect property. So when you do, act fast. And I have had experiences with buyers where they lost out on three homes from not acting fast enough. And then what happens, it takes maybe three to six months to find another home that they're interested in. So that's definitely a, a challenge that buyers face. And also, I would say that sellers face the same issue where they drag their feet when they get an offer that is a fair offer, and they're like, and if let's say I just listed the property, I just put it on the market, and I already show it to a few, a handful of buyers, and we get it, we get an offer in the first week, and it's a fair market offer, and the sellers, like, oh, since I got so much interest in the first week, I know I can sell it for more, and they won't even. Yeah, so people think, especially since you get so much traction right out the gate, then, right. okay, then I'm going to get, I got one offer now, I'm going to get another one soon, and it will be better. I know it will, because I'm not going to sell it to my first person that gives me an offer. But I, I think that's very, a big mistake there, because you don't want to throw away a bird at hand waiting for two more to come. It, it's yeah. right, it's, an offer is right in your hand. If you want a higher price, let's negotiate it out. Let's negotiate it yeah. out. Let's not just throw it on the wayside thinking you're going to get better automatically. Okay. What question did I? What questions did I forget to ask that you wish I had asked? Hmm. Let's I can't see. Believe I slowed you down. That was the first time I slowed you down in 45 minutes. Pretty good. I know. I now uh -huh. you stumped me. I'm trying to think uh -huh. of any questions so, that you haven't well, asked. Well, when we hang up, you'll, you'll, when we hang up, you'll think of five. Oh, I should have told me that. Okay. I know. That. Tell us I who know. you are. Tell us who you are and what you'd like us to do. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Crystal Lee Hempel. I am owner and principal broker of Crystal Lee Realty in Boca Raton, Florida. I help sellers sell their home, buyers find their dream home. I also help landlords in um, representation and real estate advising, as well as interior design and home staging. And not to mention, I do property management. So I'm your one-stop wow. shop for all your real estate service needs. Oh, that was good. That was great. And uh, will you take phone calls? I take phone calls. You can reach me on my office line at 561-859-0849. Or you can reach me on my cell phone at area code 713-391-5710. Good stuff. Now tell me uh, who the client is. Describe the client you're looking for. My ideal client is someone who is familiar with the market and who understands the economics of doing a business deal. Someone that is not uh, penny wise, dollar foolish. Someone who is willing to make the investment a lifetime that they know that they'll be happy with a trusted real estate advisor like myself and I'd be more than happy to assist them through the entire process from start to finish. So someone who's willing to team up with me to get a deal done. Okay, that's terrific. 
You did a great job. I, I hate to finish the interview because I'm suspect if we had four hours that you could do all four hours. <laughs> you've got a, you're, you're just, it's catty catty. You know, I'm catty catty. You're an encyclopedia of knowledge. You just you. All I have to do is trigger you, and you you go on. You go on on that stuff. Which is great. So that shows you. Uh, you did your homework. There's no doubt about that. Congratulations. Nice job on the interview. And uh, and what I'll do next is let you say your name again and just your website, and then we'll call it a day. You did a great job, and I'm proud of you, and I'm sure you're going to do well. All right. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Now go ahead and give you your crystal with a C and then go from there and give you a website address in case people, and hopefully they'll get in touch with you. Okay, great. My name is Crystal with a C, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L, Lee, L-E-I-G-H, Hemphill, H-E, M as in Mary, P as in Paul, H-I-L-L. I am owner and principal broker of Crystal Lee Realty in Boca Raton, Florida. Check out my website at www.crystalcrystalleeigh.com. Again, that's crystalleerealty.com. Thank you for joining us today. Go to tedthomas.com to learn how you can start making smart, smart, secure investments today. Be sure to check out the rest of the episode to find out more about Imagine Wealth Without Risk.